We have a good God. Amen. Amen. Um, yeah, I, I, I hope and pray that as you think about your relationship with the Lord, that you are able to rejoice in your salvation. Um, we are a blessed people by His grace. If you have your Bibles, open them up to 1 John chapter 2. We are going to um, continue our study of the Experiencing God um, book, the seven realities that we've been walking through. We've been going through that over the past uh, 12 to 13 weeks as a faith family and in our services. We've been walking through it over the last seven weeks as we've kind of re-hit each one of those and kind of um, nailed down the things that uh, stuck out through each of these looked at scripture as we applied these, and then hopefully challenged ourselves with actually living them out. Uh, We have walked through it, and so these uh, realities, uh, again, God is always at work looking at the fact that we have a God who is bringing to a conclusion everything in him. The summing up of all things in Christ, right, is what Um, We are told this is the big, beautiful picture of what God is doing and bringing a people to himself, summing up all things in Christ, that he, to do that, he brings that people to himself by pursuing us in a continuing love relationship that engages us not just corporately, but engages us personally as well, that's real and personal. God invites us then to join him in what he is doing. And the way that he does that is he speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, uh, prayer, circumstances, the church, and calls us um, to understand who he is in his character, his purposes, his ways. And then we kind of rubber meet the road kind of time. As we have heard from him and heard of him, then we are to respond to him. And so that all leads to a crisis of belief that requires for us to take Steps of faith and action in response to him. And which means there are things that are going to necessarily going to change if we are to follow him. If we are to go where he wants us to go or do the things that he wants us to do, it may require that we step out of our bones, that we um, acknowledge him in an area of our lives and we surrender something to him. Whatever it happens to be, these were the adjustments that we were called to in obedience. And then really the entire thrust of the study, which is the last one, you come to know God by experience as you obey him and as he accomplishes his work through you. That seventh reality is really ultimately one of the things that I talked about in the groups that I led was the goal is that we would know him. And so we come to do that as we walk through it. And so if you look at the diagram um, of this whole picture, notice that we, God was at work the whole time, and what he's doing is he's bringing us into that, that global narrative that he is doing. And so here we were, and he says, no, I'm, I'm bringing you into it, inviting you into so that you would know me and experience me even as you obey me and, uh, and walk with me through life. We come to know God by experience as we obey, and he accomplishes his work through us. So 1 John 2, 12 through 14 is where we're going to be this morning. And I want to use this because I love the picture that John paints here for us. And so if you have your Bibles, if you would stand in honor of God's word, and we'll read 12, 13, and 14. John writes, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. So I've written to you, children, because you know the Father. I've written to you, fathers, because you know him who, was, who has been from the beginning. And I've written to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you. And you've overcome the evil one. You pray with me. 
Father, as we look to this reality that we come to know you as we walk in light of you and walk with you and allow you to work through us. I thank you for the picture here of spiritual progression. And as we consider this, would you, would you work in our hearts to reveal where we are in this journey? And would you, by your grace, continue to beckon us and call us deeper still? Father, help us as we sit under your word to be people that hear, that would be your people who understand and know your voice and the things that you're saying to us even through this text. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so pick a relationship whether that's the husband-wife journey, it begins with the dating. You know that dating leads ultimately to maybe engagement, leads to marriage. There's phases of this journey, right? Um, dating is that time where you are nervous. Everything is kind of, ha, ah. you're you're mind and your little heart are going all over the place. You're trying to get this girl to believe that you're actually worthy of dating. <laughs> Please don't see all the other things. Just see what I want you to see right now. We'll deal with those other things later. You, for the first time, your, your fingers kind of touch as you're sitting next to each other, and you would have thought that this is the greatest feeling you've ever had in your entire life. You're like, oh! and then, you know, you get up enough guts and you hold the hand and you're like, oh my goodness. And then you put a bucket underneath of it so it catches all the sweat. <laughs> and over time, it's exciting and it's, it's new, but we would definitely say that that's not mature. There's trust that has to be developed. There's experiences that have to be gone through. So much so that as I was in uh, my last week of our experiencing God with my older group, one lady said, by the time we got to our older age, I could finish his sentences because I knew how he thought. There's a progression. This happens with a, a parent and a child. It can happen in a relationship in any circumstance, whether you're a neighbor, a coworker, whether you're put together as group partners in school. There's a level of getting to know one another, having that acquaintance, having a relationship established because of proximity or because of work or because of school, and that you're now in, and so now you just begin to develop that. And it begins to become deeper and deeper. Or maybe it reveals itself that it won't go much deeper at all, depending on how things are. As we look at a spiritual reality of this journey, this progression, one thing becomes very clear for us as we understand the gospel, that without the forgiveness of sin applied to our lives, one spiritual life, i.e. a personal relationship with the Lord, is non-existent. First thing I want you to say is this, by nature we do not have a relationship with God as Father. By nature, we do not have a relationship with God as Father. Now, you might say, wait a minute. That doesn't sound right. We do have a relationship with him as creator. We do have a relationship with him as image bearer, though marred. We do have a relationship with him and will have a relationship with him regardless as judge, even if we reject him as Lord and Savior. We have a relationship with him as God, worthy of worship, praise, and obedience. But we do not naturally have one that cries out, Abba, Father. John gives us a picture here of the child, and he gives us actually two different Greek words when he's just using these two parallel statements. In the English, we just use child in both of them, but one of them has to do with the relational part, the, the birthing of the child, the new life that is now established, the parent-child relationship. Really, we understand that as the born-again believer idea that we are in relationship with the Father, we've been adopted as sons and daughters of the King. 
The other one has to do more with the trainee. It comes from a Greek word that means to train up. It's the one who's in subordination, the one who's being crafted and molded and shaped into that which it is to ultimately become. It's the picture of taking the child that the parent is dedicating themselves to raise and then getting them to graduation Sunday only to realize that there's still a lot more to go. But each step along the way. Like a child, a relationship spiritually is established in a birth when our sins are forgiven and we're placed into the family of God. It is the beginning of the journey of true life. Hear this. Life experienced, true life is life experienced in the context for which it was created. Life found in relating to and finding satisfaction in the very one who made all things and sustains all things. That is life. This is eternal life, that you would know the Father and the Son that he has sent, John 17. That true life only begins when a sin-marred nature is crucified with Christ. And the Spirit takes up residence in the heart of the believer, giving both a new nature and a new position made possible by the blood of Christ on the cross as he provided a means for the forgiveness of sin. I write to you, children, because your sins are forgiven. The relationship is established. You did not know him as father, but now I write to you because you do. You have a relationship because you have been born again. Over the past several months, we've been able to celebrate with at least 10 people on recent baptisms. We still have at least three to go. We rejoice with these new believers, those who have chosen not only to profess Christ, but to follow him in obedience by getting baptized. And as I pray for them, there is a common prayer that I basically always pray over a new believer, that God would guard their paths forward, that he would give them grace to walk with him, that he would protect them from the enemy when they are vulnerable, that he would give them an assurance of his presence and his promises. We recognize that a child, as beautiful as it is, as cute as it is, and you want to just hold it and stare at it, it's still very vulnerable in the journey. There's a lot of growing up to do. There are things that we'll want to protect them from. There are things that they're going to be exposed to that we're going to help them understand. But one thing we know about a child is that a child embraces the relationship of the family, the protection of a parent, and their close association with them. This is always evident when you have that child that clings to mom or dad when a stranger stands just a little too close, i.e. me. There's this weird timeline in the life of every child that my excitement and exuberance terrifies them completely and they hide behind their parents. They get over it and then I become their best friend. But until then, I have to recognize, okay, give them a moment. It's that child that reaches for their parent's hand in the grocery store or in the crowd because they're going, oh no, I'm not getting lost. It's that terrified child who grabs onto the hold of this person's leg and has been walking with him for a couple feet, looks up and goes, oh, no, you're not the right one. And there's something about a child that embraces and enjoys that they've got this father and that they trust this father, even as they're coming to know them and be in relationship with them. It's the introduction, our affections for the very first time are kindled to loving our God and to be in, in a relationship with him. As we grow, the second thing I want you to see is this. Spiritual birth should lead ultimately to victorious living. It should produce a change. Evidence of God in our lives. Verse 13 says, I write to you young men because you've overcome the evil one. The other one, it says, I write to you, young men, because you're strong. The word of God abides in you. You've overcome the evil one. There's victory. Man, I think of, humor me for those that are older, the young men. I remember the days 
the days where I could run and not grow weary, when I could jump and at one point, believe it or not, could dunk a basketball, days when nicks and scratches healed in a timely manner and fashion. Amen? Seriously. I remember when I could read things that were just inches in front of me. Now I realize why God's given me these long arms as I try to read them. And yes, I know that there's lots more to look forward to as I go ahead. But boy, those younger men, those days, they were known for their fitness for success in battle. The army talks to who? The 18 to 22-year-olds, they're not knocking on 50 and 60-year-old doors. Hey, would you like? No, never mind. Sorry. Where's your son? These are the ones who are said to have life by the horns, who have the confidence and sometimes the sense of invincibility that frees them to attempt crazy things. They're the ones who are on the front lines expending the energies and reaping the rewards and the spoils of victory. For the spiritual young men, these are the ones who see the divine advance and join in that advance. They're the ones saying, here am I, send me. The conquesting kingdom becomes their experience as they see God doing that work through them. They see consistent manifestations of the kingdom conquest in their lives. Notice what John does. In each of these, he's written them in the perfect tense. The perfect tense is a, an action that was completed in the past that has resulted in new circumstances, new realities now. He says, you've overcome the evil one. You know the victory. You've lived in the victory. You are walking in light of the victory that is in Christ. This isn't fresh and new to you. No, you've you've picked up that sword alongside and you are seeing the things lived out through your life as well. But in the midst of this, let me caution you and caution my grads who just graduated. Be careful that we do not perceive a maturing relationship with God as individual strength training towards independence. If that's what we have taught you, then we have lied to you and we've gotten it wrong for you. If we've given you that impression, I'm sorry. Because that's not what it means. In our world, that's what it means. In our culture, that's what it means. Oh, you can stand, you're strong enough to stand on your own two feet. You get out there and take the world. That's not the picture of the faith. We come to know God by experience as we obey, and he accomplishes his work through us. Notice what John says. Young men, because you are strong and because the word of God abides in you, there's a source for this. It is obedience and empowerment by the Spirit. Obedience. Sometimes, can we be honest, we presume to know God and therefore permit ourselves to do what we want. We declare an understanding in the relationship, which really isn't there, and we rationalize it to justify ourselves. But the point of this is that we come to know God through experience as we obey. It's not we come to know God by the way we define Him that we think He should be so that we can live the way we want to. It's a submission to the Word of God in our lives. It's the application of truth. It is not the definition of God that we're arguing over. It's a surrender to it. That's how you come to know him, is you take the things that he has said and you apply them to your life. You don't say, God, this is how I'm going to be and I know you're going to be okay with it. That's not the picture that we have here at all. A relationship based on assumptions and presumptions and personal prerogatives is not healthy, it is not growing, it is not relationship. Instead, it is a facade for self-living and for that which God sent his son to have to die on a cross for. We claim to know God and be in surrendered relationship with him. But if our actions and our inactions prove otherwise, We need pause. 
You see, we get a proper perspective of God as he reveals himself to us as we follow him. We get a proper perspective of God as he reveals himself as we follow. This is how we come to know him and understand him. And then the power part, the one who is doing the work is never supposed to change. The one who brought us to Christ is God. The one who works through us is God. If he has called us into spiritual life, then it is contingent and dependent upon the spirit who he's set within us. Remember, this goes all the way back to week one. We are not servants sent out to do the master's will. As if he commissions us and then says, go do it in your own power or your own strength. We are vessels by which and through whom he accomplishes the very commands and tasks that he gives and assigns. He is the one working. This is what Paul would proclaim to the church at um, Colossae. He says in chapter 1, verse 29, For this purpose also I labor. I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Let me ask this question. Where do you go first for answers, for strength, for assurance, for direction? Where do you go first? Do you, do you go to your own logic and your own skill? Do you go to the medical profession? Do you go to corporate offices? Do you go to a spouse or a parent or a friend? Do you rely on your own strength? Or do you turn to God first? One way of thinking about that is this. How long into a situation does it take you before you pray? How long into a situation or circumstance does it take you before you pray? Are you the one who tries everything they could do and then you go, oh man, nothing's working. God, help me. Because that, that's living in your own strength, by your own power, with your own logic. And then when you realize that there's a way that seems right to a man and its end is death, then you go, oh, okay, let me try plan B. And God said, there wasn't ever a plan B. I'm only plan A. You could not save yourself. You cannot sustain yourself. You could not live the spiritual life. I am the spiritual life. this This is a reality that we have got to get through our heads. So if you're going to be a victorious young man of the faith, young woman of the faith, out there seeing victory, it is not because you have accomplished the victory on his behalf, but it's because he's accomplished it through you for his glory, for his name's sake, and for your enjoyment and satisfaction. We will not come to know God truly or fully if all we do, if we do all things in our own power and strength. We're not going to come to know God truly or fully if we're doing it in our own strength. It doesn't matter if it comes out successfully and we thank God afterwards. Then look, Lord, it turned out great. Thank you. Well, that's great you acknowledged him at some point, but really he was the one that needed to be doing it the whole time. When things turn out successful sometimes in our eyes are sometimes not so successful in his. Empty praise and lip service must be that much more disheartening and distasteful in his sight. You ever been in that situation where someone gives you praise but they're the ones that did everything? And you're like, why, you did it all. Like, why are you doing that? And I feel like God's saying, seriously? Like, you're going to come to me and and thank me. You didn't even invite me into the process. But I appreciate the acknowledgement because I actually worked through you and in you, even to your lack of recognition or dependence upon me. This is the continuance of our faith, our affections now burning for the one who saved us and seeing victories overcome. Third group of people, though, is the fathers which is, I think, a picture of the goal of life. The goal of life is to know him, to know God. Both times, John doesn't doesn't change a word in the Greek. He says, I write to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. The aim for which we are made is to experience 
him to experience and know this God. It is not to know his will. It is not to know more about him. It is not to feel good about living a more consistent, victorious life. It is not to receive blessings from him or answers to our prayers. It is simply to know him. It is to know him in such a way as to rest in him and in the relationship that he has given us. Ultimately, it is to think like him, to be conformed to his image more and more, being transformed from glory to glory. To act like Him because we're surrendering ourselves, allowing His Spirit to manifest Him through us more and more often and more and more noticeably. John Stott says, it is of the deep communion of God into which we are invited. All Christians, because of the new life given to them by the Spirit, know God. But it's those who have allowed it to season well, to ripen over quality time. You see, coming to know an immutable God who has always been, who has never changed, the eternal God, means that we are looking to this God to know him and understand him. So often we can be perplexed by the things going on around us. We don't understand things that seem to indicate that God might be haphazard or unclear or being different in different situations, and we don't see a cohesive, coherent heart of God. And yet, for the mature believer, one who has come to be resting in that identity of who God is, knowing Him, the one who is from the beginning, those things can be settled even left in peace because we know Him. The relationship properly deepens as we properly submit ourselves to the Word of God and the God of the Word. Hear hear me in this. Just because you've been in a relationship for a long time does not mean that that relationship is mature. It does not mean that it's rich or deep. And honestly, it may not even mean that you have a relationship. There may be coexistence. Just because you've got 20 years, 30 years, 50 years under your belt doesn't mean that your marriage is more healthy. Should it mean that? Could it mean that? Yes. But it doesn't guarantee it. Time isn't that which makes these things better. Time is just the vehicle by which it happens. Just because you've had a title for a long time or reached an anniversary of sorts doesn't mean that you have great advice to share either. Can I tell you this? I, as I've gotten older, hear me all the way out. I have come to realize that elderly doesn't necessarily mean sweet. Docile doesn't necessarily mean um, that they're a disciple. Soft-spoken doesn't mean it's godly counsel. I remember I, when I first like, would take trips into a nursing home or senior living area and start talking to people, most people moved a little slower, right? A little more laid back for the most part. There was always that guy. But I always thought, oh, they're all, they must all be sweet Christian people. But then I remembered something and I started learning something. They are the same ones who at age 40 and 50 were jerks potentially and just got slowed down. They can't be as jerky anymore. My wife will tell me about people that come into the hospital. Man, it's like the, the, as you get older, you have this card that you get to play that you're allowed to just speak your mind and tell everybody what's reality. Because you've earned it. It's like a badge. Let me tell you, I don't want to be the cranky old person. I, I, and I'm going to have to choose every day not to be the cranky old person as I get older the one who deserves a right to be heard because I've lasted longer on the planet. Like, I want to be someone who looks more and more like Jesus every day and sounds more and more like him. Can you think of older people who you would say, hey, they know him who was from the beginning? Those are the people I want to be around. Those are the people I want pouring into me. I'm not just going to assume gray hair means that that's who they are. Because there are people half their age that are 20,000 leagues down the road spiritually further. Because it's not just time, it's quality of that time that matters. 
John is writing here. This is the journey. You know him who was from the beginning. And because of that, you smell like him, you act like him, you talk like him, you know how he thinks, and you live out an expression of his life through you because you're allowing him to do it. Don't you want to be there? I would love a church full of us like that. Could you imagine the Spirit of God working freely through all of us as we allow him to affect every bit of us so that the fruit of the Spirit is evident in us? Man, this community needs that. It doesn't need us fighting inside. It doesn't need us trying to posture ourselves against one another. It doesn't need us playing this card or that card against one another. Because life isn't about that. It's about who you know. Let the wise man not boast in his wisdom. Not let the rich man boast in his riches. Not let the mighty man boast in his strength. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he both knows me. Like, that's the invitation of this whole thing. Do you know him? Do you know him deeply? Or do you just know about him? Some of us have many years, and we're still children. These two things do not equate. The completion of our faith is that our affections are burning deeply and richly and fully for the one who saved us. I have this picture in my mind as I thought about the, the idea of the maturing believer. And I leave you with this because we've been doing this burning bush on every slide, so we might as well talk about fire. Think about the three stages spiritually. There's an ignition in the heart. God lights a fire in us, places his, his fire within us, the Holy Spirit indwelling us. The fire comes to life, but it's very early. But there's, there's excitement there, right? Man, my, my son the other day, he used his fire starter to start the fire. And it was, it was like you, I mean, it was the greatest moment. Maybe in the history of all mankind, it was, it was Prometheus. Whatever that story is, I remember learning, right? It was fire is here. It has come to my son. But guess what he had to do? He had to baby it and make sure that, it, that that spark got somewhere. And then it started roaring, right? It was growing fuller and fuller in that moment. There was confidence now that this thing could, could really handle some of the bigger sticks. Right? It didn't need just the little tiny stuff to keep it going. It was ready for some mature meat. But then there comes a point in a fire. You know that moment when the smoke, it's done smoking. And it's just this red glow because everything is now cooking. Let me ask you, over which of the three do you want to roast your marshmallow? It's number three. Life gets good at number three. Do you know the Father? You pray with me. Father, I thank you for that journey. I thank you that we get to know you. Help us to ever thirst and ever seek more. I thank you for the journey that you placed us on. Don't, don't let us settle. Don't let us walk away. Show us where we're living in our own strength by our own power. Don't let us live in facades. Bring us into a relationship that is deep, that burns in a way that is rich and full, that is satisfied. Help us to see where we are. And God, if there are those in this room who have never had that moment where they've begun that relationship truly, would you open eyes to see it? Would you reveal yourself? In Jesus' name I pray, amen.